So spiders are a kind of a tough subject to bring up to a lot of people because there's a, a great emotional charge collectively held against spiders. A lot of people are self-described arachnophobes and usually kill spiders on sight and are convinced that they have been bitten multiple times by spiders. I'm, I'm bearing all this in mind, but we're going to go ahead and go forward with it. Most of the things that I say about the spiders here can equally apply to all spiders west of Colorado. Let's talk about this phenomenon of spider bites. Most Americans, if you ask them, believe that they have been bitten by a spider. But if you ask most Americans, have you ever seen a spider biting a person? The answer is no. Has anybody in here ever seen a spider biting a person? Yeah. And also, if you look on the internet, there's pictures of everything on the internet except for spiders biting people. There's, a, there's one from a German horror movie, but it's a plastic spider. You can even find pictures of ball lightning, an extremely rare atmospheric phenomenon, before you find pictures of a spider biting a person. You think, with all the people who firmly believe that they've been bitten by a spider, one of them might have gotten an image of it one time. But so far, it hasn't made it to the internet. The typical scenario, it got me in my sleep. So, how do you know? Was there a spider involved or not? It was when you were sleeping. So, if we're talking about strict scientific evidence, that doesn't really quite meet the bar. The other one is a little bit more serious and probably a little bit more germane to our gathering here, that the medical professional has identified something as a spider bite. This is a big bone that the arachnological community has to pick with the medical community. So, if there's no evidence of a spider being involved, please stop diagnosing spider bites. But we'll get into more of that. So here's a list, this is the short list, that these authors uh, reviewed of different conditions that were diagnosed first as spider bites and then turned out to be something else. Um, Jeffrey Isbister in Australia has done a much more thorough list, and it's pages and pages long. I wouldn't be able to fit it on the graphic of all these things that have been diagnosed by doctors as spider bites. So it's a tempting thing for medical professionals to associate a spider with some kind of, well, we're not sure what this is. Let's call it a spider bite. And it also gives the patient this badge of, I have been bitten by a dangerous <coughs> wild animal, and I came through it. So, why does this keep going on? Well, there's the internet echo chamber, so um, I have a lot of YouTube videos about spiders, and in the comments section, it's always you know, people telling, oh yeah, I've been bitten by a spider, I did too, it was in my sleep, everybody thinks that it happens, and it just goes, goes on and on and on, without that level of evidence of, oh, did you see a spider? Was there a spider? Exterminators are big ones because obviously their livelihood hangs upon people being afraid of spiders. So they don't ever comment that spiders are predators. It, it, except for a, one species in Central America, all spiders are predators. So if they're in your house, they're there to eat something. So they're probably eating some kind of insect pest. So if you want the spiders out of your house, you should just clean it. Give it a fruit. <laughs> is also a big perpetrator. Everybody loves a spider story in the media. There was just one a couple of weeks ago about a woman who lost her breast to a spider bite. <laughs> um, this was a, a morbidly obese woman with a history of diabetes and phlebitis and got this big necrotizing sore and the doctors said it was a spider bite. So maybe, maybe not, but it seems unlikely. And then the medical community. Like I said before, the medical community is pretty notorious for diagnosing necrotic lesions, or uh, if you've ever heard of MRSA, it's methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, as it turns into, you know, this kind of like nasty crater that eats into your skin, and it looks like it might be associated with other internet pictures that you would find if you Google spider bite. So, let's add in this layer of what is a confirmed spider bite. So, for a proven bite, a person has to actually witness the spider biting another person, or themselves. That almost never happens. But it does happen sometimes. I'm not going to sit up here and say that spiders don't bite people. Some people are bitten by some spiders. It does happen. There is an incidence of it. But I think it's grossly overreported. So, uh, also to confirm, you must actually recover the spider from the vicinity of a clinical skin reaction happening. And that the spider should be given to an expert for identification. So that you can't just say, oh yeah, a brown recluse bit me here in Washington, but it got away. 
We don't have brown recluses in Washington, but I'll get to that in just a second. So there's two ways that a spider can injure you. The, the spider by itself. I mean, if you froze one in liquid nitrogen and shot it at somebody, yes, that would hurt them too. <laughs> so there's mechanical damage, which is the actual action of the fangs pinching into you. So there are a lot of large ground-dwelling spiders, like wolf spiders, that you find over on the east side that can actually puncture your skin if you really harass them. But they only do it in defense, and you really have to corner them and smash them a bit before they'll even think of biting you, because they just want to get away. They think you're going to try to eat them. A lot of things eat spiders. And then there's envenomation, and that's the actual injection of venom under your skin through the spider's fangs. Now wait, you say, we're in a zoonotic disease workshop. What about this mechanical damage here? Could not some kind of pathogen come in on the spider's fangs? It could. It's not impossible. In fact, I found this article where a woman was infected by Apophysomyces elegans, which is a filamentous soil fungus that was associated with a spider bite. So, and the authors did great diligence figuring out what this fungus was. They went through all the steps to find out what this weird fungus was that infected this lady and actually killed her. But they did not do very much diligence on asking whether a spider actually bit her or not. So now it's become enthroned in the medical <coughs> literature that a spider bite can be associated with this other pathogen. And it turns out that this pathogen, although rare, is becoming more common, and it also it comes in on puncture wounds. So let's talk about the spiders of confirmed medical significance. Over, over the entire world, there's six or seven genera that are associated with actual medical conditions. We have two in the United States, the black widow, the western black widow here in Washington, Lacrodectris hesperus, which is recognized by this characteristic uh, red hourglass on the underside. And this is in the family Theridiidae, which we also call the cobweb spiders. This is not a moving spider. It's going to stay in its own spot where it's built its web, and it bites people who put their hands or feet or elbows or whatever into that web. So this is not going to sneak across your bed and bite you in your sleep. Here, they're mostly found in the dry eastern regions. Um, and if we're talking about the whole west of America, west of Colorado, I would say these spiders are common. Uh, where I grew up in Colorado, there were a lot of them. but bites were very rare. So we have a couple of island populations here in Washington, but most of them are confined to east of the Cascades. Their poison, their venom, uh, the active ingredient, it's a cocktail of things, um, but the active ingredient is called alpha lactotoxin. Here's the description of what it does, but a lot of that doesn't make sense to me. It's a, it causes neurotransmitter release, so it's a neurotoxin. There have been many efforts to characterize what this stuff actually does to you, but it's hard to do because you don't know whether you got a whole dose of the poison in the bite or not, or if you, what we call a wet or a dry bite. Uh, there's a lot of individual variation on how people react to it, and it's hard to tell whether you've actually been bitten or not, because the fangs are so small that you, sometimes they don't even leave a mark. The common effects that everybody seems to report are pain diaphoresis, which is sweating, and hypertension. And there is an antivenin available, and there have been no deaths reported from this spider's bite in the last 30 years. If you go back a little bit in the literature, actually you can go way back in the literature with these spiders, not just the black widows, but the widow spiders overall. You can find mentions of widow spiders in Greek writing. So even the Greeks back in the Bronze Age knew that widow spider bites would cause damage to people. So I'm mentioning that because when we get to the hobo spiders, there's nothing in, that old, in the old literature saying that hobo spiders bite people. But this guy, Meredic, here, he's a Yugoslavian researcher, and he had this giant list of things associated with spider bites, with, with widow spider bites. Um, but if you look at the first couple of sentences, since the bite itself is usually very mild, more than half of my patients working in the field did not know that they had been bitten. So was there a spider or not? Patients bitten during sleep awoke only when general symptoms appeared. So maybe there was a spider, maybe not. Now let's move on to the brown recluse. This is a pretty famous spider, and most Americans believe that it lives in their neighborhood. And you can tell this by the fiddle-shaped mark, and if you're brave, you can get close enough on these things to see that they have only six eyes. Um, now these are, these are reclusive spiders. They're hard to find. You don't usually see them walking around when they're in their habitat. There are a couple of California species that 
sort of resemble them. The southern house spider, Bucania hibernalis, has a similar mark, but it has eight eyes and a, a different body structure. Here's where they live. And these boundaries are pretty well defined. So this northern boundary is creeping upwards a little bit towards Chicago, but not very quickly. And that's probably associated with climate change. This is where, in general, breeding sustained populations of brown recluses can be found. And there are a couple of other species of recluse spiders that you can find down in this area, but they're not known to bite people. So here is a map of where physicians can diagnose brown recluse bites. <laughs> but this, the, here's the argument that I hear a lot on the internet. But what if the spider got picked up in, into a truck, you know, somebody picked up a box in Kansas where brown recluses are common and put it in their truck and drove it over to California? What if? Yes, that is logically defensible. There's nothing to say that that can't happen. But where are the spiders? If these many bites are happening, why are the bites the only thing that's showing up about these spiders? Sometimes a, a couple of specimens every few years show up in these western states. They have been collected in Washington, Oregon, and California, usually squashed on the bottom of a box that came from one of those other places or in a shipping container or something. No sustaining population has ever been found of them. So if they are coming over here, why are we not seeing the actual spiders? So spiders with suspected medical significance. We saw this yellow sack spider before. Um, and this all comes from this single publication in 1970. And I'm going to point out this word here, probable. <laughs> so probable, it's, it's able to be probed. So let's probe it a little bit. Is it really happening? <laughs> And the, all of the cases cited in this were, there was no actual confirmation of a spider biting a person. But this paper has been reduplicated and cited in other medical literature. And I'm sure that you can all think of other cases of things like this where some symptom or causal agent was misattributed to a disease and that it just got reproduced in the literature over and over and over again so that when somebody finally did find out what was causing the problem that you have this giant body of literature saying you know it's this when we now know it's this and so how do you go back and unwind and unspool all of that it's a, a difficult process but what they did with this uh, yellow sack spider is that they ground up venom glands and injected the venom into guinea pigs and it didn't cause necrosis. So, and then they did a venom analysis and it was negative for derma necrosis inducing compounds. So um, that one is now no longer considered to be a dangerous spider. Now the Bobo spider, there's a great deal of belief that this spider actually is a, a big problem. Now I had a look and I put the spider in dollar sign there because this is a big money thing. You know, if you call the exterminator and you say you have Bobo spiders, they're gonna come in and put multiple applications at hundreds of dollars each of this barrier ring around your house to keep the hobo spiders out. And out of 33 Pacific Northwest pest control websites that I looked at, 23 mentioned the hobo spiders in a negative way, and 13 of them mentioned brown recluses. And here are some direct quotes. In some cases, spiders are a real threat to humans to the point of death. Any spider bite can become infected and fatal. The hobo spider is anything but harmless. Now we come to Darwin Vest. I'd love to ask this guy about his experiments, but he disappeared in 1999, and nobody's been able to find out what happened to him. So he got nine rabbits and let hobo spiders bite them. Um, There's no mention of sterile technique. He had no control group, and he had variable results. But that did not stop him from making a career out of hobo spider bites. So here's our probable, probable necrotic lesions. So here we go, the Tegenaria aggressus was either identified as the biter by the victim, so people being bitten by spiders are not really good at identifying the species of the spiders. And then here's this great wording, obviously the probable agent of the bite. <laughs> here's one where he uses probable in all these different cases and concludes, manifestations of Tegenaria aggressus bite may range from insignificant local lesions to extensive tissue necrosis, and in rare cases, hematological dyspraxias and death. So, when after he disappeared, the torch was taken up by Acre and Katz, who made this preposterous claim 
Investigations of hobo, hobo spider bites show the venom produces skin injuries or lesions similar to those produced by the brown recluse. Therefore, ulcerating lesions of this type occurring on humans in Washington, Oregon, and Idaho are almost exclusively due to bites by the hobo spider. So these two gentlemen are also deceased now as well. But this information has been picked up in the medical literature and reproduced. You can find it on the CDC website. So here's the case against hobo spiders actually being problematic. They're native to Europe. They've been living alongside people since at least the Iron Age, probably a lot longer. And there's no European medical literature associating spider, this kind of spider with bites, the way there are with the, um, with the widow spiders that I mentioned before. So Greta Binford concluded that the European the hobo spider and the American hobo spider, because it's an invasive species here, or a, it, not invasive, but it just lives here now, and that the venom was, in, was identical in composition, more or less. And she, and she also found that the female venom was more potent than the male, different than what Darwin Best found. So maybe the spider is the vector of a dermonecrotic microorganism. It's since been found that a lot of spider venom contains <coughs> antimicrobial agents. Also, spiders groom meticulously. If you ever sit and watch a spider, they like to clean themselves. Gavin Wainwright and her friends assayed the internal and external flora, so they ground up at the outsides of spiders and the insides of spiders and spread it out on petri dishes and see what they could grow. And they didn't find anything that you wouldn't find anywhere else. They also tried to see if they could get a hobo spider to track MRSA-causing bacteria from one location to another, and they were unsuccessful. So the conclusion is that the hobo spider is not harmful. There, nobody's been able to prove, other than Darwin Best, uh, that this actually does anything to anybody. The brown recluse, harmful, but good luck finding it in Washington. The yellow sack spider, again, there's no real solid scientific evidence that this causes any problems. Black widow, watch out. Um, but if somebody comes in complaining of a black widow spider bite, there is an antivenom to give them. So, my recommendation is in the absence of clear evidence of spider involvement, diagnoses of spider bites are probably not appropriate. And that any spiders associated with injury should be collected and turned over to a specialist for expert identification. All right, thank you very much. Yeah. No, there, there's a, there's a, um, that, that, um, false widow, it's not exactly a mimic, but it, it looks very similar to it. Um, she has the red belly. She doesn't have the red belly. The only one with the red belly is the black widow. Yeah. Um, I've heard that the hobo spider doesn't crawl on the same side of the web as regular spiders, and that the regular spiders eat it. Is that true? No, the hobo spider is not a web-dwelling spider. Uh, the hobo spider is a hunting and lunging spider. It's only ever going to be found on the ground. Okay. So if you see it on the wall, it's not a hobo spider. Anybody else? Yeah. Who would be a qualified specialist beside you? Um, <laughs> Rob Crawford at the Burke Museum uh, out of UW. Um, and there are a few others around the state. Um, Gene Malichke who works with USDA in Yakima. Um, there's also a lot of qualified people on the internet on a site called Bug Guide. If you post pictures of spiders or other insects, the qualified people will identify them for you. But you need to get closer than you know the spider way down there. And <laughs> yeah? Um, there, there's a spider that is a See, this is, this is really difficult to say because um, it might not be an insect at all. So a recent survey of spider bite-like symptoms that were occurring on military bases turned out that it was bacteria. Um, so they sprayed the bases down and they went through and they couldn't find, the, the only spiders they could find were web building spiders that don't bite people. And, um, and then they found out that these lesions were being spread by um, just person to person contact. So it's really hard to look at, it's impossible, in fact, to look at you know, an injury in somebody's skin and say 
what caused it. It'd be like trying to identify a bird by the peck mark that it left. <laughs> Difficult, if not impossible. Yeah? Um, just kind of out of curiosity, maybe not a realm of your expertise, but is there any, because I do, where I live, have like an overflow. I'm, I'm a queen person with element, um, but an overflow of these home spiders during the months of September, October, that just kind of made, I used to put down city traps, and within a day or two, I, I have like 20 of them. Where do you live? I live over in Kitsap, in Silverdale area. Okay. And I have, a, I have a young child and a dog, so I'm kind of, you know, obviously spider bites are not so much anymore, but just it's overwhelming to see a big guy crawling across sure, the Sure, sure, sure. Like, so they're not coming out of your house, they're coming into your house. So those are the males. Um, so the females of that spider in nature, without any human dwellings, they live in crevices and next to fallen logs and things like that. So houses are a good proxy for that. And so when the males are looking for the females, they want to go check out all the crevices that they can to see if there are females in there. And so that's why you get this huge influx of these guys. You know, it's kind of, the, it's like they're stopping by the bar to see if there are any ladies. <laughs> 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 the next guy comes along. No, no, if, if you just leave it alone, it'll leave by itself. Um, so, you know, the sticky traps work fine. Um, you know, if you really don't want it in your house, like, um, spiders will always move away from anything touching their rear legs. So, and that does not set off the freak out impulse in spiders. So, they'll, you know, just kind of, they don't go crazy when you just touch their back legs. Um, so, just use a broom and scoot it towards the door if you don't want to kill it. I mean, you can't kill it if you want. Just, you know, don't catch it in a jar and microwave, but don't be cruel. <laughs> <laughs> Alright. Toro, can you stop by and give this presentation to my wife and daughter? <laughs> 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 Most of us here too, so I can show it to my wife.